Right, okay, morning, everyone. Um, so continuing on with Jung's theory, this is now probably the parts of the theory that you're maybe more familiar with, certainly the parts that are more well known. So um, extroversion and introversion, you know, these are pretty well used concepts. Um, the ideas behind them really go back to the ancient Greeks, but it's really Jung who's given credit for coining these terms and adding them to the psychological uh, literature. So for Jung, everyone has a dominant attitude or a preferred attitude, okay, which is all about, for Jung, about how you um, orientate psychic energy, okay? So, you know, when we talk about extroversion con in contemporary psychology, we usually think about it as a spectrum, right? And, you know, if you're on the high end, you're considered extroverted. If you're on the low end, you'd be considered introverted. And most people are somewhere in the middle, but it's a spectrum that's to do with characteristics that are to do with being talkative and lively and enthusiastic and sociable. But for Jung, it's all about how you really orientate your energy. So if you're extroverted, you're orientating this psychic energy outwards into the outside world, looking to socialize, looking for ways to receive some sort of stimulation, okay, for interacting with the outside world. Whereas if you're introverted, you're orientating this psychic energy inwards, okay? And what motivates you and what energizes you is inner experiences like deep thinking, fantasies, daydreaming, reading, okay? These sorts of more introspective and um, uh, uh, reserved or alone um, activities. So obviously what that will look like is that extroverts come across, of course, more sociable and lively and social experiences because that's where they're orientating their energy and that's how they're energized for interacting with the outside world. Whereas for introverts, it's the opposite, right? They might be exhausted by these sorts of um, outward experiences, okay? And they're energized through these inner activities. Now, for Jung, everyone has the potential, okay, to be both extroverted and introverted. It's just that one develops a preference, okay? And you develop a preference pretty early in your development. And by the time you're around 10 years of age, it's a, a pretty then strong preference, okay? So the more and more that you rely upon that preference, the more and more of a preference it becomes. But for Jung, you know, the preferred one, the dominant one, then is the one that's operating consciously. And the one that you're less and less using, the one that's becoming less and less preferred, is operating more and more unconsciously, okay? But it's still operating. So, you know, introverts, for example, for the most part might be quite reserved, but maybe this extroverted side will come out in some context, like when they're interviewing for a job or something like that, in which they maybe have to be more assertive and talkative, okay? So the potential for both is always still there. And remember, for Jung, part of this individuation process is that as you get older, you're striving towards a level of balance, right? So for Jung, during this process, you're actually becoming more and more balanced in terms of your introversion and extroversion, okay? Eventually later in your development. Um, so for Jung, he describes himself as introverted for most of his life, okay? But by the later stage of his life, he believed he had reached a level of balance, okay? In which he can no longer be described as introverted or extroverted, okay? Because he had reached balance. Um, between them. Now, there are also psychological functions, okay? Um, these are to do with how you process information, how you make decisions, okay, how you operate in the world. So there are two forms of rational functions and then two forms of non-rational functions. Um, the rational functions, um, I prefer to call judging functions, okay, but they're judging or rational functions. They're to do with how you make judgments, how you make decisions, okay. And then the non-rational functions, I prefer to call perceiving functions, okay, but they're non-rational or perceiving functions. They're to do with how you perceive the world, how you process information, okay. So for the rational, there's two different types, and for the non-rational, there's two different types. 
And again, everyone has a preference, okay? So you develop a preference for one of these rational or judging functions, and you develop a preference for one of these non-rational or perceiving functions. So the rational functions are either thinking or feeling. So if you prefer the thinking function, um, the thinking function, then you're someone who makes decisions based upon hard data, concrete facts, okay? You're looking for logical decisions, trying to be objective. If you're someone who makes decisions using the feeling function, okay, then you're someone who uses more subjective data, okay, the feelings of others, your personal values, your personal subjective feelings, okay, this is what you're using as a guide when it comes to making decisions in your life. Then for the non-rational perceiving functions, these are intuition versus sensing, okay, so if you're sensing your Paying attention to the present, okay, and you're looking at the small details, okay, you're detail orientated, okay, whereas if you're the intuitive type, okay, what you're processing, what you're taking in when you look at the world around you is not necessarily the small details, okay, it's the kind of big picture, okay, so if you're the intuitive type, you're typically more future orientated, usually more prone to daydreaming and fantasies, but you're more focused on what the end results might be, what the big picture is, rather than on the kind of small pieces, okay, that make it up. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about that, because what we actually find is that each of these different functions can be orientated outwards or inwards, okay? So there's actually eight cognitive functions or eight um eight cognitive functions or <clears throat> psychological types. So Jung's best known book is the text Psychological Types, in which he believes that your type based upon which of these functions is your most <laughs> dominant function, okay? So again, it's the case, right, that everyone has the potential for both thinking and feeling, intuition and sensing, but again, you have a preference, okay? And in terms of what this preference might be, it can be introverted or it's extroverted and um, equal. I'm, I'm gonna talk more about what that really looks like, but you know, to give a, a, a basic quick example, you know, if it was introverted feeling, okay, then you're making decisions based upon your subjective feelings, your values. If it's extroverted feeling, you're using the feelings of those around you, trying to make sure that there's harmony in your environment, okay? So for Jung, everyone has the potential for all of these eight psychological or cognitive functions, okay? And so you, have, but you have develop a stack, okay? With your most preferred one at the top and then your least preferred one at the bottom, okay? The top four operates consciously, the bottom four operates unconsciously, okay? So what we're really interested in is only the top four when we look at people's individual stacks. But for Jung, your psychological type is based upon which of these eight functions is your most dominant, your most preferred function, okay? But you also have three more that operate consciously, your auxiliary or secondary function, okay? Your third function, and then your inferior um, or fourth function, okay? But there's four functions that are operating consciously that you will use in your life, okay? Now, in terms of what this stack looks like, okay? So you have these four at the top of your stack, okay? The four functions that you're using. The top one um, is your preferred, your dominant function, okay? The secondary or auxiliary function, okay? Has to be the opposite of the first in terms of whether it's rational or non-rational, okay? So the primary function, if it's rational, the secondary has to be non-rational, okay? Or if the primary is non-rational, the secondary has to be rational, okay? You can't have two rationals at the top of your stack. You can't have two non-rationals at the top of your stack. The third function is the exact opposite of the second. I'm gonna give you some examples so this you know, is easier to swallow, but the third function is the exact opposite of the second. So if the second is introverted feeling, 
Okay, the opposite of introverted is extroverted. The opposite of feeling is thinking. So the third function is extroverted thinking if the second is introverted feeling, okay? And then the inferior function is always the exact opposite of the first function, okay? So if the first function is introverted intuition, then the opposite of introverted is extroverted. The opposite of intuition is sensing. So the fourth function would be extroverted sensing, okay? I'm going to come back to these typing rules, okay? But to sum up what these eight cognitive functions look like individually. So I talked about feelings, about making decisions based upon feelings, subjective data, right? The introverted version of it is your own personal feelings, your own personal values. What do I think about this, okay? The extroverted feeling is about what do the people around me think about this, okay? How can I keep my environment in harmony? So extroverted feeling types are very agreeable, very cooperative, very compliant, right? Because they're looking to make the people around them happy and that's what they're using as a guide, okay? Um, thinking then is about making decisions based upon cold facts, right? Objective data. If you're an extroverted thinking type, okay? You want the world around you to make logical sense, okay? You're, you know, extending okay your view of logic into the world around you so someone who's extroverted thinking is going to be pretty assertive right they want an ordered environment okay they want everything to make sense logical sense okay based upon concrete facts hard data whereas if you're the introverted thinking type okay you're also logical in nature but it's less important to you that this is reflective in the world around you because you're not orientating the energy outwards, right? You're orientating the energy inwards. So you study things to try and make sure that they make sense to you, that they make sense with your understanding of logic, that your understanding of the world makes sense of this, okay? But they're going to be less assertive in situations because they're not as likely to extend this to the outside world. <clears throat> Sensing then is about paying attention, right? to the actual present world, the real world, okay? They're not people who are heads in the clouds thinking about fantasies or possibilities in the future. Sensing types are more grounded in reality, okay? They're experiencing the world through their senses, okay? How can they taste and feel and taste it and feel it and hear it, okay? And, and so on. So the extroverted sensing type just want to be living in the moment, okay? Experiencing everything that they can. Okay, so that's how they are energized. That's how they want to live their life. Okay, they want to experience lots of sounds, lots of smells, lots of tastes. Okay, and they're energized through experiences, through their senses. Okay, whereas the introverted sensing type, okay, they're also drawn to reality, the present day. Okay, but they're more inward focused. So when they experience the world through their senses, they're tying it back to previous memories, okay? You know, what does this painting remind me of? Okay, what does this um, food that I have eaten remind me of? Okay, again, they're experiencing the world through their senses, but it's more inward, okay? Trying to relate it back to past experiences rather than the um, current experience for what it is. <clears throat> and then intuitive types, they're not really looking at the world as it is necessarily, okay? They're looking to pick up on patterns, okay? To pick up on kind of general themes if they're looking at paintings, for example, okay? So what they're looking for is um, a bit more subjective, but it's um, what's the kind of the big picture of what I'm looking at, okay? Rather than the small parts, okay? So an extroverted intuitive type Okay, they love talking about possibilities and ideas, and they love talking about ideas and bouncing around possibilities and exploring possibilities with other people. Okay, which is a big difference between an extroverted intuitive type and an extroverted sensing type. Okay, if, if it was two people, for example, talking about planning a trip together, okay, and you know what they want to do on this trip, all the experiences they want to have. Just talking about it would be enough to energize the extroverted intuitive type, okay? Because bouncing around ideas and 
exploring ideas in their own minds, their own fantasies, okay, that energizes them. Whereas that would not be enough to energize an extroverted sensing type because they actually need to experience it. So, okay, they actually need to go on the trip and actually experience what it's like in order to feel this same level of heightened energy. <clears throat> um, and then introverted intuitive types, okay, are also drawn to possibilities, big picture, okay, rather than small details. But again, they're more introspective, right? So for them, it's about kind of daydreaming on their own, okay, fantasies on their own, exploring one idea as much as they can in their own minds as much as possible, okay, rather than necessarily exploring multiple possibilities um, with multiple uh, conversations and so on. So don't take this too seriously, but it's just something I put together to you know, kind of get to the core of what the differences are between these different functions, okay, that might help. So you should know that these cognitive functions are often illustrated using two letters, okay? So small i or small e in terms of whether it's introverted or extroverted in its orientation, and then f for feeling, t for thinking, s for sensing, and then we use N for intuition because we already use I for introversion, okay? So, you know, if you're a introverted feeling type, you know, when you're making decisions, you think, well, how do I feel about this? If you're extroverted, you're extroverted feeling, you think, well, how do they feel about this? Um, introverted thinking, how does it make sense with what I know? Extroverted thinking, well, how would this make sense implemented in the real world? How would it make sense in relation to these external parameters. Introverted sensing, what does it remind me of? Extroverted sensing, you know, what is it? How can I explore it with my senses right now? Um, introverted intuition, well, what's the meaning behind this? Okay. Intuitive types are, you know, drawn to big, big picture questions as well, like why? Okay. Why is this the way it is? Okay. Whereas sensing types don't ask that. Okay. They're just wanting to understand it for what it is. Um, and then extroverted intuitive types, okay? Not just what's up with this idea, but what's all the other ideas associated with it, okay? How can they explore all these other related um, avenues? You should know one big difference um, is that extroverted intuitive types are very, very quick thinking, okay? They can explore multiple possibilities simultaneously, okay? Which is why it's been found that a number of the best chess players in the world have extroverted intuition high in their stack, okay? Because obviously being able to explore simultaneously multiple possibilities is a good um, strength to have in the world of chess. Um, but also when neural, neural imaging studies have looked at the brain waves, uh, the, the, the parts of the brain that are becoming active, um, and these eight different types, the only real difference is that, that more of the brain is active all at once in the extroverted intuitive types rather than the other types. And there isn't really a great other general difference in the um, brain activity of these different types. So introverted feeling lives by their own rules. Extroverted feeling lives by the rules of others. Introverted thinking lives to understand the rules. Extroverted thinking lives to rule others. Introverted sensing lives in the past. Extroverted sensing lives in the present. Introverted intuitive lives in the future, right? Future orientated. Um, and then extroverted intuition lives simultaneously in multiple futures, okay? Because they're not looking at just one pathway that they want, one possibility. They think about multiple possibilities, okay? Extroverted intuitive types don't like to be boxed in, okay? They like to have options. They like to have multiple possibilities for them. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, could you repeat what the letters are again? Yeah, okay. So the small letters are introverted or extroverted. And then the big letters are feeling, thinking, sensing, and then N for intuition. Any other questions? So you can think about the fact that so far there's a preference between introverted and extroverted, a preference between thinking and feeling, 
and then a preference between intuition and sensing, right? Which are the functions that Jung came up with. But then Catherine Briggs and Isabel Myers, a mother-daughter team, came up with the Myers-Briggs that you've probably heard of before, right? Um, and when coming up with this, they came up with another dichotomy, okay, which is judging versus perceiving, okay? So judging types like to be prepared, okay? They like to feel as though they know what's coming, okay, so that they're prepared for when it comes. Whereas perceiving types prefer to adapt, okay, and live spontaneously, okay, and adapt to the moment as it arises. So based upon then these different preferences in terms of these four different dichotomies, right, there's then 16 possibilities, right, which is the 16 personality types in the Myers-Briggs, okay. This is based upon four preferences, right? How do you orientate your energy outwards, meaning that you're energized through outward activities, extroverted or introverted, energized through inward activities, right? Sensing, okay, how do you take in information? Are you looking at the small details or intuition? Are you looking at the big picture? So an example of this that's quite often used in HR activities is that when the people in the um, program take the marriage brig and then are split into sensing types and intuitive types, they all look at the same picture, okay? It's a picture of a forest and in the forest is a number of strange things like a rocking horse, a child's toy, an umbrella. And then you ask everyone, what do you see? It's the same question. They'll look for the same thing, but the answers are very different. The sensing types list what they see. They see, I see trees, I see an umbrella, I see a rocking horse. The intuitive types give some big picture answer. They say, I see an enchanted forest, okay, or something that's along those lines, okay? So what it is that they're actually, you know, paying attention to, the way in which they're interpreting it is different, okay? For sensing types, it's all about the individual steps. For intuitive types, it's all about the end result, the big picture. Thinking, feeling, do you make decisions based upon code, hard logic, data, or subjective feelings, okay? So a good way to think about this is if you imagine you're a manager and you've been told you need to let someone go, how would you go about making that decision? If you were a thinking type, you would need some objective way of doing it, like looking at the number of sales and then getting rid of the person who has the least sales. If you're a feeling type, you're going to be looking more at subjective data to do with feelings, okay? If I get rid of this person, what would that do with morale, okay, in the in the workplace, okay? How would that affect people's feelings and other um, criteria such as this, okay? So that's a big difference. <clears throat> and then judging versus perceiving, okay? How do you organize the world? Do you like to be orderly? Do you like to be prepared, okay, which is the judging type? Or perceiving, do you like to just adapt and live in the moment more spontaneous, okay? So this could be, you know, differences in terms of how you prepare for a trip or a holiday, right? So you kind of have a, you know, a to-do list and you have a, you know, a, a kind of planner of all the main things you want to do on your trip, okay, maybe broken down, you know, day by day, okay? Or do you kind of just wing it, okay? And once you're there, do you just then find what you want to do and explore what you want, what you want to do and adapt once you're there, okay? Obviously, the judging type would prepare, okay, um, most likely, whereas the perceiving type is um, adapting once they're there. These, these differences make sense. You can also think about them in relation to the big five. If you're familiar with the big five, okay, um, extroversion obviously correlates with the first one. Extroverts are higher in extroversion. And um, openness in the big five correlates with the second one. Okay. Intuitive types are higher in openness in comparison to sensors. Okay. The final type or the final dichotomy correlates with conscientiousness. Okay. Judging types are higher in conscientiousness. Perceiving types are lower in conscientiousness. 
These are all strong correlations. The third one is a moderate correlation, okay? But it moderately correlates with agreeableness, okay? Feeling types are higher in agreeableness on average, and thinking types are lower in agreeableness. Yeah. Um, do you ignore sensing or intuition? Okay. So sensing, intuition is about how you process information, how you perceive the world, okay? Um, are you paying attention to the small details? So listing what you see, right? Which would be like the individual things in the picture I was talking about. Whereas intuitive types are drawn to the big picture, okay? Um, so like the big picture answer, the enchanted forest kind of answer that I was talking about. So, you know, if you're an intuitive type, you know, you might be accused of, you know, um, not seeing the individual trees because you're focusing too much on the forest, right? Whereas for sensors, it's the opposite, right? They're focusing on the individual elements. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions? So there's a number of online tests you can do, right? That measure your, your Myers-Briggs, which of these 16 types you are. But what they're doing is, you know, they're looking at your four preferences, right? Do you have a preference for introversion over extroversion, sensing over intuition, thinking over feeling, judging over perceiving, which, you know, according to this one would mean your Snape and, and Harry Potter, right? But there's multiple tests for multiple fandoms, right? But what these tests are doing is that they're working out which of these preferences these characters have and then which one do you match up with. The most popular of these tests is the 16 personalities websites, okay? It comes with it, a number of resources. It tells you, for example, the strengths and weaknesses of each type, how each type usually operates as a parent, the kinds of jobs that are most suited for each type, how you are in relationships, how you are as a friend, okay, in multiple different way, multiple different areas of your life. Um, the main issue with these online tests is that they're really looking at this as if it was a kind of big five survey, okay? They're giving you an extroversion survey, and then they're seeing on what side of the average you fall, okay? If you're above average, your class is extroverted. If you're below average, your class is introverted. Okay. So these online tests, you know, they're assuming large between group differences and zero within group differences, right? But, you know, if you picture this as a normal distribution, right, most people are near the middle, right? And then, you know, imagine someone scores um, maybe here just above average. And then someone scores at the very, very high end, right? These two people are given the exact same type, but in reality, are they going to be the exact same when one is so higher in extroversion than the other? Obviously not, okay? There's going to be more within group differences than these tests give um, acknowledgement to. Also, these online tests have pretty poor reliability, okay? 50% of people, who retake them get a different type the second time they take it, okay? That's half of people get a different type. Usually it's only one letter that changes and more often than not, it's the thinking feeling type that's most likely to change the third letter. But all of them have not great reliability in these online tests. And that's not too hard to understand why, right? Because most people are scoring near the middle. The vast majority of people are scoring very near the middle. Okay. And if you're very near the middle, you only have to answer slightly differently next time to get a different score. Okay. Because maybe you're two points above average this time. Okay. And the next time you take it, you're one point below average. That's a different type, but it's only three points difference. Okay. So these online tests are not really picturing or capturing rather what Jung really was talking about. Okay. Or even what the original Myers Briggs tests was looking for um, from My um, Myers and Briggs. The best way of typing someone is based upon the stack of their cognitive functions, okay? So you all have a stack that we've talked about, right, of these cognitive functions. Each one corresponds to a different one of these 16 types, okay? So if you really want to understand your type, 
The best way of doing it is understanding the cognitive functions, thinking what's my preferred dominant function, what's my secondary function, okay? And how does that then match up with these different types, okay? So, you know, the, the, the best measurements of the Myers-Briggs, the original test, gets to know a person, okay? And then based upon the stack they have of their cognitive functions, that's how they're typed, okay? Rather than just simply using this dichotomy, okay? But obviously that's very, very time-consuming, laborious, difficult research to do, right? And you can't really capture that on an online test either. So for research purposes and for online test purposes, it's usually just working out one's dichotomy, okay, the, the pre preference on whether they're um, introverted, extroverted, what side of these they fall upon, okay? But if you really want an in-depth, accurate idea of your type, you have to understand the individual functions, okay, and what your stack is. Any questions on anything so far? Okay. Um, you know, you have your notes when you do the exam and you do the quiz. You might be asked to type someone, okay? If you are typing someone, okay, what you have to do is actually understand the mean differences, okay, between the preferences and understand the functions, okay? Don't just look at some adjectives, some labels, okay, that are often applied to these different types, okay? Because they're generalizations, okay? they're not really going to be that helpful, right? You know, INTJs, okay, are often described as being cold and aloof, okay, because they use introverted thinking, okay, which is a pretty solitary function, okay, it doesn't really require much interaction with others, and it's you no know, based upon logic rather than feelings of others. But it doesn't mean that every single INTJ is actually always going to come across as being cold and aloof, right? Okay, so if you're just typing people based upon some basic adjectives, okay, that's not going to be helpful for the quiz, okay? So we have the 16 different types, the different function stack, and these are some, you know, characteristics that often describe them, but, but again, you know, don't take these too seriously, okay? They're generalizations, okay? I don't want you to use these characteristics as how you type people, okay? Especially in the quiz. Um, there is also another PowerPoint slide on Canvas, by the way, that goes into more detail on the cognitive functions if you want that extra information, okay? But, you know, if you think about these characteristics in relation to the cognitive functions, it's quite easy to see how they tie together, right? You know, if we look at, for example, um, INFJ, right? described as being altruistic, okay? Well, that makes sense because they're using extroverted feeling high up, okay? They care about the well-being of others, okay? They're using that as a guide for making decisions, okay? So that means they are going to be more altruistic and empathetic and compassionate because they want to make sure that the people around them are feeling positive, okay? Um, they're also described as being um, perfectionistic, Again, makes sense, okay? They're a judging type. They like things to be in a certain way. They like things to be orderly. Um, and insightful, determined, again, makes sense because the primary function is introverted intuition, right? Which is looking for meanings beneath the surface, right? Big picture ideas, okay? They're future orientated. So they have an idea goal in mind, okay? That they're striving towards. Um, if we look at maybe INTP, okay, described as being insensitive, right? Again, makes sense because they're not having feeling high up um, in the stack, right? Extroverted feeling is their inferior function, okay? They're more likely to use cold logic, okay? Hard data to make decisions, okay? So it makes sense that they might in some cases come across as being a bit insensitive. Um, but also, you know, extroverted intuition is high, introverted thinking is high. So they're logical and also they're quick thinking and drawn to possibilities and exploring ideas and possibilities. So it makes sense that they would be 
good at coming up with ideas that they would be described as ingenious, right? Um, and maybe also unconventional, right? Because intuitive types, you know, are not necessarily drawn to what is, okay? They're more drawn to what could be and bigger questions such as this. And then they're introverted. So it makes sense also that they might be described as being private, right? Um, and, and, you know, I, I could keep going, but it makes sense, right? ENTJs, you know, extroverted thinking, that means that they're using logic to make sure that the world around them is logical. So they might be described as being quite blunt and direct, okay, quite forceful, okay, because they're trying to, you know, in, impose their way of how things should be onto the outside world around them, right? Yeah. Makes sense. Any questions? Um, okay, I, I can talk a little bit more about how you type these 16 different types, but like how you come up with their functions, I mean, for each of the 16 different types, but I don't want to overwhelm you by giving you more than you need. Um, but I don't know, are you, are you interested in working out how you work out the stack for each function? Or like multiple it will be multiple choice and so long as you understand the dichotomies and the primary function it'll be easy to work out okay okay i can maybe i can come back to the typing rules um if we have time at the end but i've given you what you need okay so far for the for the quiz and the exams anything else would be extra Um, okay, so you know that's kind of the most well-known part about Jung's theory. Okay, these psychological functions, these psychological types. He didn't come up with Myers Briggs, right? But it's based heavily upon his work, right? It's directly linked. Now, when it comes to psychotherapy or understanding mental illness in Jung's theory, he really uses this concept of complexes. Okay which is really patterns of emotions, memories, perceptions, wishes, anything that's maladaptive, okay, and that centers around a particular theme, okay? So it really could be anything so long as it's a burden on one's life that can be conscious or unconscious. So, you know, for example, you know, maybe you have a scar on your face or some, you know, deformity or something such as that. It's not necessarily a complex right unless it's something that you're always thinking about you're always thinking about you know how can i conceal this how can i hide this what are people going to think about me when i go out in public okay and then maybe that's stopping you from you know going out in some situations um so it's a burden on your life right and all of these worries all of these maladaptive thoughts all of these negative perceptions they're centered around one thing okay they're centered around this particular scar or deformity whatever it is that you feel um self-conscious about but a complex could be anything, okay? Any kind of insecurity, any kind of um, anything that's holding you back, okay? So long as it's, again, maladaptive, having a negative impact on your life. <clears throat> so the main goal of psychotherapy for Jung is to understand these complexes, okay? To make the person fully aware, fully conscious of the complexes, why they maybe have these complexes. And then that would be the first step into, you know, no, like, no longer letting it be a burden on your life, okay? You know, trying to, you know, redirect your thoughts, okay? Trying to not focus on it so negatively. Um, so, you know, Jung's also trying to tap into the unconscious in psychotherapy. He uses a lot of the same ideas that Freud did, um, free association, dream analysis, projective tests. And um, but one test he came up with, which is pretty widely used, is the word association test. It's kind of similar to free association, but you're given a word and then you just say the word that comes to mind. Okay. So you've probably you know seen some variants on this, right? In maybe TV shows or movies or some somewhere else. But you know, you're presented with a word. It's a word that 
you know, could be emotionally evoking, okay, or maybe has the potential to unearth a particular complex, okay. And again, you wouldn't pay too much attention to one response, right? But if you're getting a number of responses that all center around one particular theme or one particular insecurity, then that may indicate that there is a complex here you want to probe further into, right? Similar to the the TAT test that we looked at, right? So the ink blot test, right? We're looking for recurring themes, okay, that maybe reflect some underlying insecurity. Um, and then active imagination is allowing participants or clients, patients to un unleash their 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 fantasies, okay, their their daydreaming, their imagination, either in story form, okay, or in picture form. And seeing what kind of archetypes, okay, that they're focusing on and the stories that they come up with, okay, or the stories that they're illustrating. Okay. So, you know, for Jung, you know, the archetypes that you're most fixated on, you're more focused on, that could be reflective of what's happening right now in your life. But also remember, we're trying to reach individuation, right? Integration. Okay. So if there's a part of your psyche that's being neglected, okay then that could be dropping, creeping up to the surface, okay? If you don't have conscious awareness of your shadow, for example, right, then that could be coming out even without you knowing it, okay? Maybe through dreams, maybe through um, the stories that you tell, okay? So much like Freud, Jung also put a lot of importance on dream analysis. But for him, he also would study the archetypes, okay, that are emerging in your dreams. Um, there's some important differences between him and Freud. First of all, Jung did not believe in analyzing just one dream, okay? He believed you had to have a series of dreams so that you could look for um, a pattern, right? A theme that's emerging across dreams. Also, Freud believed in universal symbols, that there were universal ways of interpreting dreams, okay? So this in a dream typically means this. But for Jung, there was no such universality when it came to interpreting dreams, okay? For Jung, you know, what, what a symbol means to you might be different than what it means to someone else. So for Jung, you have to really get to know the person before you begin to interpret what their dreams mean. Also, Remember, Freud believed that dreams were wish fulfillments stemming from the id, and that the dreams were being distorted by the ego, okay, to protect you from the true desires of the id, right? So that the ego was distorting the dream, and you had to really dig beneath the surface to understand what the dream was really trying to tell you, okay? For Jung, this isn't the case, okay? For Jung, dreams are not distortions. They're just doing the best that they can, okay, to communicate what they want to communicate. And therefore, Jung doesn't make the distinction between manifest content and latent content in the way that Freud did, right? Remember, Freud looked at what's on the surface and what's the underlying meaning behind it, okay? Jung didn't bother with this kind of distinction. So like I say, Jung would work with a series of dreams rather than one individual dream, okay? And this is called amplification, okay? When looking at a number of dreams and trying to see across these dreams, what are they trying to tell me? What's the theme that's emerging, okay? What's the underlying message that's, you know, consistent throughout? Uh, and then this is just a table that splits up some of the differences I was talking about between Jung and Freud, okay? Um, so for Jung, you know, these are just creative expressions of the unconscious. They're not stemming from the id. They're not distorted. Um, they don't fit into any particular formula. But also remember, Jung has the idea of the collective unconscious. So your dreams, your archetypes can be coming from either your own unconscious or the collective unconscious. Okay. But, you know, of course, Freud doesn't have the collective unconscious in his theory. So it's just coming from your own personal reservoir of memories. So Jung has had 
a, a quite a fair bit of impact. Okay, the word association test is well used. He did it himself, developed the Myers Briggs test. But the Myers Briggs test is widely used. It's it sells over a million copies in the US to companies for training um, sessions and HR activities and to help with recruitment and so on. A number of the top 100 companies in the US use it. Um, it's also popular you know, online with the general public and so on. A number of people are kind of familiar with what their Myers-Briggs type is. Um, he's had a large influence on other theorists. You know, Abraham Maslow's self-actualization is directly um, inspired by the individuation process and self-realization in Jung's theory, and um, that we'll talk later more about. Um, he put importance on later stages of life rather than just the early stages like Freud did. Um, came up with the midlife crisis, right, which is something that's fairly well used now or talked about. Um, people's future roles, not just past orientated creatures. He has cross-cultural support for his ideas from looking at multiple countries, okay. Um, but his ideas are very, very abstract, right? He's really talking in symbols. He's talking metaphorically. It's difficult for many people to grasp. Um, it hasn't really been accepted for the most part by mainstream psychology. Um, and also there's an influence from multiple disciplines, right? There's influences here from myths and religion. And for some, this will be off-putting. And obviously it's so abstract, it's very difficult to research, right? You can't really even necessarily operationalize exactly everything he's talking about. And it can't really be scientifically tested um, either. And then most of his ideas are based upon case studies and observations. So again, these are, you know, they, they fall to the same limitations as Freud's um, approach uh, approaches did. Um, so for Jung, both nature and nurture are contributing to personality, a pretty moderate stance on whether you have free will or whether it's determined. Um, but he does believe in personality changing, okay, because for him, personality development is a much longer process, right, than for Freud. And these are the key takeaway points. Any questions on anything here on Jung's theory? No questions because it's it's I've overwhelmed you or and you don't know where to begin or no questions because you, you understand it. It's all fine. Okay, the second. Okay. Um. So what, what I'd like you to do is complete the Mars break test. Okay. Um. There's one up on the Canvas page. Okay, that you can use. You could also look up the Sixteen Personalities website if you want. Or you could even take both and compare and see, you know, are you getting the same type when you take both types? Um, and then think about it in relation, not just to the dichotomies, but also to the, the, the functions, right? The stack, look on the slides to see the stack that you would have. Think, does this seem true? Does it seem to represent your personality? And, you know, does it seem to be a useful test, do you think, for capturing personality? Um, and I want you to, you know, consider this as we go throughout the course and look at these various different tests and theories. You know, you should all have your own ideas on, you know, which tests, which theories capture the differences in people well and explain and describe those differences well. Okay, which one's better or worse than others? Um, on the top of the campus page, there's also a Word document that you can use or not use. It's up to you. But I've put it together so you can keep track of your scores on the different tests we use. So you could add your Mars Brig, your big five scores, your attachment styles, and the other test results as we go through. Okay. <clears throat> and that way you can make comparisons between the different results. If I was working at INFJ, right, there's four functions, right? They're high in the stack. Okay. The first one has to be introverted. Okay. Because it's an introverted type. Okay. So whatever it's going to be, it's going to be small high, right? For the function. The second one has to be um, the opposite in terms of extroverted or introverted. Okay. So the second one's going to be extroverted. The third one needs to be opposite 
of the second one exactly, okay? So the third one's going to be small i. Fourth one needs to be opposite exactly the first one. So the first one's going to be small e. Now we just need to work out, right, if it's going to be thinking, feeling, sensing, intuition. We know that the top two need to be intuition in F because they have a preference for intuition over sensing and they have a preference for feeling over thinking, okay? So one of these is going to be N, one of them is going to be F, okay? In terms of how you work out which is which, okay? If they're a judging type, okay, then it's the judging function that's extroverted, okay? So in this case, that's feeling, right? Feeling is the judging type that's here. And the introverted one is the perceiving type, okay, which in this case is intuition. The third needs to be exactly the opposite of the second. So the exact opposite of extroverted feeling is introverted thinking. The last one needs to be the exact opposite of the first, okay, exact opposite of introverted intuition is extroverted sensing, right? So it's going to end up being N I F E T I S E. Um, I'll give you another example. So ENFP. So we know the first one's going to be some extroverted function, right? Because they're extroverted. So it's going to be small e, which means it's going to be small i, small e, small i, right? So then it's working out whether the top one is n or f. Right. Remember, if they're a perceiving function, okay, it's the perceiving function that's extroverted. If they're a judging type, it's the judging function that's extroverted. They're perceiving type, so it has to be the perceiving function, which is intuition, that's extroverted, right? Which in this case is N, okay, which means that the second one has to be F. The third is the exact opposite of the second, which in this case is T. And then the final one has to be the exact opposite of the first, right? Which in this case is S. Um, so I'll, this time, you just tell me, okay? So if I do ENTP, how do I work it out? Was maybe first thing I do? <clears throat> it's going to be a little E, right? A little I. E, I, right? And then the letter on top, why is it N? Sorry? Isn't it type? Yeah, yeah, just use a right, just explain why. So the top letter is intuition, but why? Right, it's perceiving, which means it's the extroverted, um, that's the extroverted one. Uh, what's the second function? Hmm? F. F, yeah, why is F? Uh, because the opposite of the first one. Well, not exactly, right? It's F. Um, it's not to do with the first one, okay? It's to do with the preferences up here. Sorry? It's not feeling right. This is a T. Okay. Oh. It's the NTP. So it's T, right? Yeah. Oh. And then the third one is feeling, right? Because it's the opposite of the second one. Fourth one is sensing. Why? Because it's the opposite of the first one, right? Some of you get it. Some of you look like I'm talking Chinese. <laughs> but you don't need to know this. Like I'm just giving you more than you need to know. But it's one of those things that seem hard at first. But I promise, once you do a couple of examples, it's really easy. OK, well, I'll finish up there then, OK? If there's any questions, come up and ask. Otherwise, thanks, everyone. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.